Good morning, brethren. Good morning, sir. Today I want to speak on a topic that I call endurance. Endurance. And of course you will know it's of course coming out of the experiences we had this last week for the Challenger 2018 experience. Not many people really talk about endurance because sometimes to people endurance is almost like somebody who has no faith as if it's a lack of faith. <clears throat> Modern Christianity believes that you don't have to endure, or most people assume so. They want a Christianity or a faith that gives you instantly what you ask. And sometimes people will equate endurance with lack of faith. You ask for something from God and you don't get it and it looks as if you have no faith. Or there's maybe something wrong. Whereas, Endurance is not a lack of anything. Endurance, frankly, is an indication of grace, an understanding of God's grace and favor upon someone. It's also an indication of strength, an extreme faith on the part of the person who is having to go through that stress or whatever it is that they are enduring. <clears throat> Most people assume that if you have enough faith, and the assumption comes from a portion, if reading a, a sort of like a portion of scripture, or bits and pieces of portions of scripture, rather than looking at the totality of the subject on that topic. And they assume that if you have enough faith, you just need to ask God for something. And as quickly as possible, you will get it. Almost automatically, you will have it. And yet, the scripture tells us that our work with God is not a vacation. In fact, the old King James calls it a vocation. So if you want a cliche, you will say that our work with God is not a vacation, it's a vocation. A vocation is a job. Something that someone does for a living, day in, day out, that continues till the person dies. <coughs> in fact, um, sometimes ago, I think I read that someone once said that you cannot have sweets without sweat. And it's one of our Nigerian uh, uh, ministers or so, I think from Winners, who made that quote, that without sweet or without sweat, you cannot have sweet. <clears throat> so our calling requires us to understand the way God works with us. And endurance is one of the tools that we need to successfully, frankly, work with God and be successful in our endeavors, even in our individual physical lives, endurance. So I want to talk today about endurance. And that without that endurance, being a part of every one of us who attended Challenger, we could not have been able to get to the end of our destination, go on through all the things we went through, and safely come back home. Endurance played a strong part. It is not a question of strength, it is not a question of ability. Because when we were at the place we used, and I was talking about coming back, and I said we are going to walk this time from Yanoba or from the pier, all the way back to the church hall. Everybody, they all almost boutini. Everybody was like, what? Ah, no. Some would say, ah, me, I will faint, or so, so, and so. And everybody was like, they could not. So it tells you that even for those who didn't show as we were coming out that this was a little bit stressful on them. It was. They just endured it. And they took it. But to not think of saying, okay, we're going to endure the same thing coming back, they didn't want to have to endure that. So my point is, it's not a question of ability. So it wasn't as if anyone who did not feel it physically, as obviously as maybe some are feeling it, had some strength that the others did not have. Everybody felt it. Even I, by the time we were getting to that um, close to last again, I could feel my toes. One of my small toes was a bit tight, and it felt as if it was going to be blistered by the time we get where we're going. The second day we were walking, we came back in the evening from the two and a half hour here, two and a half hour to go. It took us about maybe an hour and a half coming back, and I wanted to sit on a chair on a bed, side saddle. As I lifted one leg up to put it on the other leg. I just felt this, my tight muscles, like, what? I touched the place and I was pain there. And I said, okay, that is good. <clears throat> At least now I know that 
I've come, I've come on challenge here. So it really was painful to everyone. But everybody had an ample amount of endurance in their minds or on themselves to be able to see to the end. I want us to look at a couple of scriptures on endurance and how all of us must begin to apply endurance in the way we relate with one another, in the way we relate with God, in the way we deal with the situation we are in, the circumstances that face us, and in the way we actually handle everything in this life, everything in this life. An ample dose of endurance is very necessary, very, very important. Let's look at our first scriptures. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. I'm going to read up to verse 3. Ephesians chapter 4, from verses 1 to 3. This is Paul speaking now. He said, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you, I beg you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Remember again what I said, that our calling or our work with God is not a vacation. It's not something you go and just enjoy and you just relax and everything is good, hunky-dory, kumbaya, like they would say. There is a matter of a calling, that is a job, something you do day in day out, something you have to stick to over a period of time. And Paul said it's a calling. If you look at the old King James, it says that work, work worthy of the vocation where which you are called. It's like the work worthy of the job or the lifestyle with which you have been called to. Enduring, frankly, should be a lifetime attitude. And every time we begin to lose faith or begin to lose patience or begin to feel like, you know, I cannot do this, we begin to use those words, I cannot, I can't. We must understand that we are lacking in endurance. And a hefty dose of endurance is really important for us to truly be successful in everything we do. Incidentally, during this, during this uh, Challenger program, Paul was asking me about a subject he said he's been hearing about in the news, and it's called emotional intelligence. How many of you have heard of that word, emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is key. It's been, in, it's been around since the early 90s. And it was popularized by one man called Goldman in 1995. And it's spread everywhere. I'm surprised it seems it's just come into play. Maybe somebody's just getting to understand or know about this in Nigeria. But emotional intelligence, frankly, requires a lot of endurance as well. In fact, the more endurance we have, the easier we can understand and use emotional intelligence. And with that level of endurance and emotional intelligence, our ability to cope with situations, with people, irrespective of what they are, how they are, and our ability to respond and not just to react to things or situations or people will be increased. And of course, our success in every area of our life will continue to increase as well. And it says, verse 2, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, enduring long or suffering long, long suffering, it says bearing with one another in love. Right here, Paul combined every subject, I mean, everything I want to talk about in this subject. He said with lowliness and gentleness. And then he said with long suffering. That is, enduring for a long time. Or, the, the word enduring for a long time is actually an oxymoron, really. When you endure, obviously there is no time frame in endurance, isn't it? Endurance simply stretches. The scripture says it is those who endure to the end. That is, they bear until there is no money to bear, until the finality of the whole situation. So it says here, according to Paul, that with long suffering, we must bear with one another. Again, endure with one another in love. Then verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. To endeavor again is almost like saying, take time. Give it time, so to say. So do whatever you need to do to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. The Greek word used when Paul talked about with the calling in which you are called, the word used there, or translated vocation in verse 1 in the Old King James, is called klesis or kletos. And it simply means a very high calling, a heavenly assignment, a holy calling to do something. And Paul is saying that we must understand that each of us have been asked to do something higher than ourselves. 
something that is very special and that's very heavenly in terms of the way we bear with one another, the way we relate with one another, and of course the way we walk with God and to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we need a hefty dose of endurance to be able to walk with God. In all the previous challenges we have gone, endurance honestly has been the key word. It has been the most important character development trait. I remember a time, I think I mentioned that, when we were walking to a, to a, a falls, and everybody seemed to be lagging behind, they were acting like they were tired, they couldn't go on. And Mr. Mickelson stopped and said, look, are you guys tired? And most people say yes. Say, okay, if you're tired, go home. Of course, there was no home they could go to. <laughs> the option is they probably should stay there and we'll meet them the second day because where we're going, we're going to camp there overnight. And they should come where they are and they'll come back and meet them the next day. And he said, go home. If people do not have endurance, there was no way they could have, they could have done that. We got into Jaws around maybe to 11 or thereabouts, the last place where we were going to tent you. Everyone probably thought we were going to stay there. But we still had an almost five hour hike in the dead of night. In the dead of night, no guide. I will only navigate by the stars since I've passed through, through that place many times. And we got to where we were going in the middle of the morning, maybe like about who knows, maybe 3 a.m. or thereabout. And then we started setting camp. I believe they required, it required a lot of endurance. Those who are short in endurance could have endured for two hours. You know, we've endured for two hours. I'm not going again. On this challenge that we had, Toby Farley, the lady who joined us, said, while we were getting to that Eba estate, in fact, she said she started telling, speaking to herself, this is a big mistake. I should not have asked to come and see <laughs> She said she thought it was just going to be fun, you know, come and catch some fun and enjoy and relax. And she told her, I want to come on this. And I pressed her and said, please, one of my friends wants to. She said she was thinking, this is a mistake. I should not have volunteered. And she was on the point of saying, you know, I'm not sure I can continue. But perhaps looking around at her friends, Perhaps looking at Ayo and looking at Toby and looking at Benga, looking at all of us, looking at Rutiwa, she figured, you know, I cannot quit. I cannot quit. And she was able to find the endurance or the courage to continue enduring. And we all got to the end. The second or third time we stopped, Mary asked for a plaster. And asking for a plaster meant she was getting a blister in her toes. Well, the toe became blister, really. Well, the blister was huge. But you know what? On our way coming back, you were wearing your shoe, wasn't it, weren't you? Or we were wearing the slippers. You were wearing your slippers. And I told them we were going to walk all the way to Lasso Gate. I get somebody bribed that king to come and pick us that. <laughs> I suspect it's probably poor. <laughs> they wanted to mutiny. They had to explain, look, Lasso Gate, that's where we're going to go. <laughs> I don't want to keep to go and enter your number, know, go and make a U-turn at me, but enter the whole door, come and pick us at the pen, and then go and turn at Alakiji or whatever. But if I go, otherwise I'll tell them, leave my car at home. We'll walk home. Say, okay, we'll walk to last week. <laughs> a hefty dose of endurance has always been a key factor in successfully seeing the challenger express through. Anyone who has no endurance could never have seen it through. And the thing is that endurance always has reward. See, while we were on that journey in 2013 to Obudu, one of us who was hard hit the most by that experience, one that had to have a guide, at least two, three guys following her, it was hard to get her to smile on the journey. However, once we get to camp and they have made the tent and they're cooking food, her mouth goes like, she talks, she laughs, she jokes, and everything. The day we are, the next morning we are supposed to walk again, everything changes again. <laughs> you think somebody has died. <clears throat> and on the journey, there is no smile. You try to joke, there is no joke at all. Jokes just go over her. There is nothing like that. But you know, that's an endurance that had no choice than to be done, isn't it? But the endurance that we ourselves choose to adopt actually will work better in helping us to deal with one another, to deal with situations in life, and frankly, to actually 
bet, better work with God. At work, at home, within ourselves, within the church, in our community, wherever it is we are, endurance can go a long way. Can go a long way in helping us. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. <clears throat> I'm going through some scriptures here to let us see that a degree of trouble or trial or difficulty comes with our vocation of being a Christian, our calling of working with God. And if our focus is on looking for the easiest, the nicest, the most relaxed, the most comfortable life, if that's what our focus is, it's nothing wrong in wanting comfort. There's nothing wrong in wanting easy. Absolutely nothing wrong. But we must understand that when situation comes upon us where we need to not be comfortable, where we need to be uncomfortable, where we need to face difficulties, trials, when there are things that push upon our patience, test our resolve to be gentle or to be understanding, we need to remember that this is normal as well. And as Christians, a hefty dose of endurance is required for us to scale through. 2 Timothy 1 8 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, <clears throat> nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So people might look out, well, that's Apostle Paul. I mean, don't you hear what they call him? Apostle Paul. So he is an apostle. You know, people have said so before. And they'll say, you know, uh, we're talking of Moses now. <clears throat> oh, we're talking of Elijah. Oh, you're talking of Paul. Those are apostles. They can endure. You know, they are men of God. <clears throat> here is Paul saying to the average convert here. says, you must but say, share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. When I said I wanted to go on Challenger, I needed people to share the suffering and the trial with me. Well, I got people to do so. God has called all of us to live for him. 2 Corinthians 5.15, I'm not turning there. It says that we should live for him who came and died and was raised for our sins, not just for ourselves. We should live for him. Many of us want to live for ourselves. And I've said this many times. Our calling has nothing to do with our preference. It has nothing to do with what we want. It has everything to do with what God expects of us. <clears throat> which is to <clears throat> not think only of our own interests, but also of the needs of others. Philippians 3.10. Philippians 3.10. Paul said, talking to the Philippian church here, he said that I may know him, that is Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and then he used the word that many people don't want to use. Everybody wants to know Christ. They want to know the power of his resurrection. They want to see the miracle that is like the one that God used to raise him up from the dead, that he used to raise up Lazarus from the dead. They want to see the power of God. And the resurrection of Christ is part of the power of God. It's a miracle power. And people want to see it. They want to see the blessing. I don't see a lot. God has won. Nobody wants to ask the question, what did I do to get the alert? The thing is, I, I don't see a lot. Now God will. It says, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. The fellowship of his suffering. God has called us to live for him. It's a vocation. It's a lifestyle. To inconvenience ourselves for one another in his service as he inconvenienced himself for us. As Christ came and died for us. But we oftentimes think too much of our own convenience. We think too much of what is important to us. We don't want to put ourselves out for anyone. And yet in our walk with God, it is part of the requirement. We will go through difficulties, we will go through trials. We should never ask, God, why am I going through this? That's a stupid question. We should be asking God, what do you want me to learn from here? And give me the courage to endure this and to see it through. Give me a hefty dose of endurance. 
And this has always been so, even from the times of old. In James 5.10, James wrote, my brethren, James 5.10, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. These are the prophets of God, those who hear the messages of God and they relay to people to follow. It says, take them, they spoke in the name of the Lord, as an example of suffering and patience. That patience, and that suffering and patience is endurance. So take them as an example of suffering and patience. Hebrews 6 talked about patiently enduring. That was talking about Abraham. That after he had patiently endured, he was able to receive that which was promised. I do not know what you have to go through. I do not know what you are enduring. Perhaps I might know a few that you've only shared. But you know all you are going through, what you are enduring, what you've been asking God for, or the situations, circumstances, the pinches, or the stresses that you've been going through. We must understand that a hefty dose of endurance as children of God is required for us to successfully see that through and see the end that God himself has prepared for us. And the scripture says his end, and the end he has for us is an expected end. It's an end that we desire, that we want. That's what God wants for us as well. In Romans chapter 6, I think it's chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, from verse 1. Yes, Romans chapter 5, from verse 1. Paul wrote, Therefore, having been declared righteous by faith, that is, justified by faith. Faith in sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Say so we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom we also have access by faith into his grace. In which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And verse 3 is the key point here. It says that not only that, we also glory in tribulations. I I wanted to feel pains in my muscles. I want to feel my heart laboring to pump blood to every part of my body. I want to feel my lungs straining to, to breathe, to take in air, and fill my blood with oxygen and send it to every part of my system on that journey. Because I know when my body is that stressed, when my heart is pumping and working that hard, and blood is going to every nook and cranny of my system. And my lungs is expanding to extract oxygen from the air and breathing it. And I'm, and I'm doing like this. I know what is happening also because of the pains and the stresses that my body is generating. My muscles. My muscles will produce lactic acid. My bone marrow, my spleen, will make lots of white blood cells, natural killer cells, soldiers that will go through my system and they're going to look for any crippled cell, any hiding virus, bacteria, any waste product that is hiding somewhere. They will go through every part of my system and all the free radicals that have come into my system because I've been having little sleep, I've not been eating regularly, I've been overstressing my body, they will go in, they will do a thorough cleanup. They will do a thorough cleanup. That suffering that I'm enduring will produce a system that's neat, that's clean, and that's strong. The same way the scripture says not only that, we glory in tribulations. As I said, I felt that we were walking a little bit too slow, and it was going to be too easy. And with all my load on my back, my, I bet my pack was probably twice the width of anyone. Because my backpack alone, without even anything in it, was already weighing up almost six kilograms. And then I started jogging. And I jogged for at least almost about probably 20, 30 minutes. Because I wanted to feel my lungs burning. I want to feel my muscles aching because I, it's almost like I glory in the pain. Not because I enjoy pain. I'm not a, a, a sadist or a masochist. 
The scripture says we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, endurance. And perseverance or endurance produces character. Character produces hope. There are times when I will be like, let us stop, let us stop. I say, Look, see that place there. That's where I'm going to stop. Five minutes, ten minutes. Okay, and you continue. What happened there? She had hope that, okay, right there we'll stop. And hope gives some energy. And she endured whatever she was feeling at them that I need to stop. I cannot continue. Please, let's stop. I say, wait, just bear. See that place there. That's where I'm going to stop. When we were at Eba, she was asking me that, ah, how are we going to get there? I said, maybe in another 35 minutes. If we don't rest more than 5 minutes or 10 minutes, we can get there in about 35 minutes. Because from here where we are, so last gate should take us like another 20 minutes, really 20 minutes. So yes, 20 minutes we can rest again. And then from there, from last gate to Yalaba, go ah, maybe another 15, 20 minutes. Last gate, last gate. And she just stood up again, and she just kept on going. She just kept on going. Again, it is hope. But that hope can only come because she's willing to endure. What if she refuses to endure? You know, I just, ah, 20 minutes again, I can't go on, I beg, I need to stop now. But she allowed herself to focus on that hope. And it produces endurance and she became stronger. That strength is character, frankly. See, it's not only that, verse 3. We glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. When God was going to call Paul, Saul, later named Paul. On the journey to Damascus, he had an experience. And God was preparing Ananias down in Jerusalem to receive Paul. I was telling him, look, this guy, I'm going to have him, he's going to come and see you, you should, retreat, you should receive him, you should pray for him, and then will, he's going to be blind. God was telling Ananias what to do. And I said, this person you're asking me to see, this guy has authority from the leader, so he has certificates, he goes around, arrests people, put them in prison, he's been persecuting your people. And God said, don't worry. Let's look at what God told Ananias. Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Put yourself in that situation. Not of Ananias, but actually of Paul. From verse 13. Acts 9, 13. Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, They're asking me to go and see. Imagine if you were that man, Saul, Paul. How much harm he has done to your sins in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from all chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, verse 15, Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles. Despite the fact that God called Saul, but Saul had to choose to follow God, isn't it? Christ died for us, but we have to choose to accept that sacrifice to be applied to us. Like everyone who came for Challenger, the call went out, but people had to choose, had to volunteer to be a part of it. <clears throat> and seeing it to the end requires a conscious choice to also endure. God says it's a chosen vessel, and it will bear his name. Before Gentiles, king and the children of Israel, verse 16 is my key point here. <clears throat> for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Someone told me I should not have mentioned that for Challenger, we will walk from Yanoba, from here to Yanoba. I should have said we're going for Challenger. We're going to start. Everybody should already assemble here in Lagos. And I said, no, that will not be good. I'm not out to unnecessarily upset people. Because people have come, they are prepared, and then on that day, and then we now carry back, they expect you to enter motor and start driving out. And I say, okay, we're going to Yanoba. <laughs> How many people will on that spot quit? 
Now, the people who quit on the spot, you will know immediately, okay, we're separating the boys from the men. But what is the point? Because that would be embarrassment, isn't it? What's the point? What do I gain? What does anybody gain from being embarrassed that way? I bet you there will be those who will on that spot quit. I beg, we're not going. Eh? Are we serious? I'm sorry, I'm not going. Then they'll start packing and then they're heading back home. But people need to know, visualize it, prepare themselves mentally. That is not going to be easy. And then, still go forth. Every time we step out to do something for God, we need to visualize all the possible problems that will come. And if we can't, we need to at least know that it will come with some problems, some issues, and we have to be willing to endure and to take it, and to simply not quit. Incidentally, in Hebrews 13, 5, God said, never will I leave you, nor forsake you. God said, I will quit. Guess who quits? If we quit, you think God will be chasing us? No, he won't chase us. God won't quit, but we can quit. Because he will not bend his own rules and standards. He won't bend it. But we can choose to say, no, I will not follow you. I quit. He won't chase us. Verse 16 says, For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my sake. Obviously, if God says he will show Saul, Paul, all the things he will endure for his sake, God must have shown him, isn't it? The scripture didn't tell us where God showed him. But at least we know one instance, when he got somewhere, and two prophets came and took his uh, belt, they tied their hands and their legs. And they said, whoever has this, the way we are tied like this, the way you tie that person, either goes to Rome and throw him into prison. That must have been one way starts of showing him, isn't it? What did Paul say? And people begged him, ah, please don't go. Ah, please don't go. It's, I imagine that when all those who wanted to go for challenger, or probably I have said he was going for challenger, he's going to walk from Kotsuto. Maybe plan with the got to go to the king. Do you know how difficult it is? Okay, can you walk from there to a better area? Let's walk to a better and see how it works. So, so. They were encouraged and said, don't go, don't go. Or any one of us would be thinking. And it's still like, you know what? I'm so good. And Paul still went. So if we are shown, if you are shown the trouble you go through in this life as a Christian, and the blessing and the joy, in quote, you will enjoy if you are a Muslim or a Baha'i, or a Shintoist, or a Buddhist, or a Hare Krishna, or a Guru Maharaji, or a whatever. What will we choose? If you are shown that this good thing you want to do, or this good deed you want to do, oh, it's going to bring you some ridicule, it's going to make you some insult, it's going to give you some offense. You are going to go through some trouble because of this good deed, or good thing you want to do. How many of us will still go ahead to still do that good deed? Why do we think Christ said, do not be weary of doing good? Why did we think that was inspired in scripture? Do not get tired of doing good. Why do you think God said that? Because doing the right thing, or doing good, or doing what is right, doesn't always bring reward immediately. It doesn't always bring satisfaction. So endurance is key to work with God to successfully navigate business, situations in life, or whatever it is, so that we can endure to the end. God knows what he wants from us. But he wants us to attain that which is promising us through difficulties. Acts 14.22. I'm not turning there. When it says, through many tribulations which shall enter what? The kingdom of God. So I want to conclude by quickly going through briefly some of the things that we may be caused to endure in this life. And let us prepare our minds as those who have been called by God with a vocation to work for Him that we're going to endure this no matter what. Things that we will be probably have to endure. See, these are issues that God's children will go through, but not all of us. Okay? Because if you look at the book of Hebrews 11, 
They talked about the problems or the things that God's children went through over the ages. It's not everyone that went through those things, right? There were those who were delivered, like Daniel, from the lion's den. But Isaiah was pulled into four paths with horses, or tied to four horses, and pulled into four places. He wrote three quarters of the prophecies in the Bible. Joseph became prime minister. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego become top officials in government. Whereas many other Israelites went to captivity. There were those who were Matthias, Jesus Christ's half brother, James, was the first one whose head was cut. And yet, John, just a disciple, one of his closest, they put him in oil to fry him. The guy had no fry. They sent him to prison, and that's where he lived 20 years before they released him and died two years after. Many of the other disciples, frankly, all the other disciples were martyred in various places. The scripture talks of those who are delivered and speaks of those who did not, who are not delivered. God knows what we need to put away from us the impurities that are in us. It's up to us sometimes. It's up to his prerogative most times. So what are the things we are likely to be called to endure in this life? First one, persecution. As a congregation, as a church, it will come, a time will come. Scripture says so, that for being a member of the church of God, for holding on to the testimony of Jesus Christ, the church will be persecuted to get a job, to get, uh, to even have a business or whatever, will become a big problem. In 2 Thessalonians, I'm not reading it, chapter 1, the church there was going through some persecution from verse 3 and 4. When Paul wrote to them, they were being persecuted as a body in Thessalonica. And Paul wrote to them, encouraging them that they should endure that same persecution that they were going through. Paul mentions that if we are going to really live for Christ, we have to be ready to suffer for him as well. So we should be prepared to have or to suffer and to endure persecutions as a body of Christ. Some of the persecutions or trouble will go through will come nationally or globally. And we need to prepare ourselves for it so that we will know that this is what's expected. We will also have personal affliction. Second, second thing we might, be need to, we might need to endure. We have personal affliction, personal trials. Maybe a need, maybe a disease or an illness. Maybe something we want from God that we're asking God for. And it seems not to be coming. We well, we need to learn to endure it. We may be in tight situation. We'll face hard choices, hard decisions. Things that will stress us, I will almost be like, what exactly is, is, is this happening to me? I mean, when is it going to come to an end? We need to understand that will come and be willing to endure that personal affliction. I remember 2 Timothy 4 5, Paul was talking to Timothy that he must endure hardship like a good soldier of Christ. He must endure difficult situation. You know, Timothy was an, was an elder, he was an elder and a pastor. And he was like an adopted son of Paul. And yet, Timothy had an ulcer. He had a problem with his stomach. He wasn't healed. He is also a sick liar. He's always falling sick every time. He's sick this week. He's not at church. He's sick next week. He's sick. Job. He's constantly falling sick. And this is a pastor. And he's an elder. And this is someone who is a protege of Apostle Paul. Who was working. And someone uh, like Peter. I think the shadow raised up the dead. Paul actually laid down on a lady who died. I can't remember if it was or so. And the person's body came to life. There was a boy who was sleeping on the edge. And he fell down from the window to the ground and died. And Paul took him up, laid on him, and the boy raised to life. There are many instances where God healed people through Paul. And this is his adopted son. He is sick, he is sick and he has stomach issues. And Paul could not tell him, please take some wine and not only water because of his stomach problems. And because of a frequent illness. So we must understand that there may be personal afflictions, I mean personal trials, and God may choose to simply want to see how we are willing to endure it. It may be issues in our families, it may be issues with our immediate husbands, wives, it may be issues with our extended family. Whatever it is, personal troubles and trials will come, and we need to be able to endure them. We know that Psalm 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but it says the Lord delivers from all of them. 
And God says we must learn to endure suffering like a good soldier. Another thing we might need to be able to endure is grief. That is from losing someone. Not only from losing someone, but actually from being unjustly accused. The Greek word used, for example, in scripture is loop or lupe, like lupe Gonzalez. even though it's not. It actually means sorrow, heartache, heaviness, and criticism and rejection by others. Those are heartache, sadness, and sorrow that come from false accusations and criticism and rejection by other people. The Bible says Jesus Christ is a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He's acquainted with being accused wrongly, he's acquainted with being rejected, he's acquainted with being cast aside as if he has no one, as if he's no one. And that form of heartache or sorrow or grief when people reject us, when people accuse us wrongly, or people treat us as if we are not important or we mean nothing or we have no one, and we feel as if we are all alone in the world, the scripture says we have to endure it. And we need to understand that Christ is someone who is used to that, so that we too will not fall under that. And finally, we will have to, okay, two more, we have to be able to endure chastening or discipline. People will correct us, people will discipline us, and oftentimes, somebody wants to be disciplined. When somebody has been corrected, we tend to focus on the fact that we have been corrected. And that the words or the way we have been corrected hurts us or it's harm us. We think, oh, it's too harsh. Forget about the harshness. Think about the lesson. Is the correction, we, if we learn to focus on the message of the correction or the content of that correction, we will be improving ourselves and we'll be learning to endure. Because if we discount or discountenance the manner in which that correction or that chastening comes, and simply focus on the correction itself, we're actually developing patience, we're developing endurance. And it can help us to grow, to progress in life. Even the scripture says that it is he whom the Lord loves that he chastens. That if we're not chastened, say we are illegitimate. You do everything you want, nobody corrects you. Ah, if I talk now, hmm, I know that's what will happen. And people treat us like that. It means they're not treating us as family. They're treating us as those who are bastards, illegitimate. It's not my own. After whatever it is, is problem. But when we do something and people call us and they correct us and they talk to us, strongly or whatever, let's focus on what they're telling us and seeing whether these things are things we can change and improve on. And that's some of the things we need to endure. And finally, we need to be able to endure temptation. Temptation comes in two categories. It's either one where people want to entice us or drag us into evil, or a form of test or trial. God doesn't tempt us with the first one. That is the function of the devil. When he brings up situations that will push us to do that which is not right. The one that God allows in our life is the trial, or a test to see whether we have learned what we're supposed to learn. And the Bible says we must endure temptation, and if we endure, it says eventually, will be delivered from me. In talking to the disciples, Christ spoke of three things that they need to do in Luke 9, 23. They must learn to deny themselves. That is, with wholesome gratification from themselves for the sake of his gospel. They must be willing to take up their cross every day and follow him. That is, whatever situation they find themselves in, embrace it, accept it, and still focus on doing that which our Lord has asked us to do. And finally, we must follow in the examples of him, Jesus Christ, of our leader. We must be willing to follow his example. And a lot of his lifestyle is there in the scriptures for us to read. So I'm not going to go through them. But I will end by asking us to read Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Matthew 10, 22. The words there are not strange to us. And I've used them even in the course of this message. In talking to the disciples, Christ said, You will be hated by all for my name's sake. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures, verse 23, verse 22 still, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Sabbath shalom. Amen.